Welcome to the Forge and Brains podcast. I'm Gavin Cooper, joined along with my friend and co-host, Riley Kirkpatrick. We've joined together to dive into the greatest minds of hard work and tradesmen to tell their story through podcasts. Let's get into it. Here we go. So what are we, uh, what are we getting into here, Riley? Man, so I don't think that we're, we're diving into a market that has a hole, really. There's a bunch of podcasts out there. There's podcasts for tradesmen. There's podcasts for farriers, which me and Gavin are both farriers. We, most of our friends are farriers and horseshoers. So it's probably most of our guests are going to end up being farriers and horseshoers. And probably most of them have been on a podcast before about being a farrier. But man, there's always those questions that when you're listening to the podcast that you wish could be answered and especially that you want to dive you, into. Especially when you might know the person to oh, a little bit sure. of de- degree and you're like, man, I wish he would have talked about that story because that thing is super funny. Oh, it's super funny or maybe have like a big connection of like, that's why he ended up in the next place where he was going yeah. or doing, you know? Relatable so it's like, to yourself. Yeah, so like, I think that's where we're coming from on this is that me and Gavin are pretty deep dived into the farrier world and we know a lot of these people and we've been in these situations ourselves, and man, it's kind of like life takes you on some swings and how you were raised and stuff had a lot to do with that. So that's what we are wanting to dive into as a podcast and as for us, probably figuring out our lives a little bit more. It's kind of where the name, uh, forging brains came about is, um, you know, this isn't necessarily going to only be about forging, but it's you know we are forgers we're horseshoers we're farriers and we're kind of like getting into the brains and like what makes you tick you know yeah how do you go about your day how do you get along in your day or your life you know to keep going to keep pushing forward yeah it is a freaking struggle we're out there by ourselves as tradesmen a lot you get in your head so it's like man it's a it's an interesting world when you have that much th- thinking time really it's something i you know ponder about all the time especially when you're in the truck by yourself is like man how does he get through the day you know because i have days where i struggle where i'm like man i really don't want to be shooting horses today but i also wonder like how does riley or you know it could be anybody else could be like craig or jim or whatever and how do they get through those days you know oh and not even like through those days like Especially in the world of like social media, we get to see everybody's like highlight reel. And yeah, twenty twenty two. Like, yeah, even the older tied guys are like telling you they're like, oh, man. A lot of time they are filling in the like the crap, the yeah. shit. They like really kind of suck. Totally. And so it's like it turns into a little bit of a highlight reel. So even when you're in your everyday, you're like, oh, I wanted this guy never had to deal with a bad horse. Yeah, he you're never dealt with the, the crappy great. client. Like, yep, man. But they did. They did have to deal with that shit. And so oh, yeah. I want to. I want to know, I want to feel, you know, misery loves company. I want to, I want the company. And not only, you know, we don't want to hear how everybody struggles or whatever, but we also want to figure out how did they get to be so great and how, you know, what did they have to go through to get to the top level that they're at or to succeed in their trade? Oh, because it's easy to think that like the must be nice syndrome of you see them at the top and you're like, they probably rode the easy train all the way there and it's like yeah, no that's no. the cool part is like they there's a lot of hours spent they overcame it they got this success like they had good times and they that's what kept them driving so yeah. it was a I, man that stuff's always pretty interesting to me like it's motivational to me you know hearing you know like how many hours somebody has spent it's like you feel like you have spent a lot of hours and then you hear somebody else and you're like dang i really need to try more Oh, dude, it's like you it, that's like the shoe pile pictures are there for were like really yeah. popular. And it was it was a big motivator that you'd see a guy's yeah. shoe pile and his pile is monster. It would motivate me to make my pile bigger when I was prepping for a contest. Because there's no way to hide that. No. There's no way you could like go and like buy the, the little piles, like no. add them up in there so they looked like more. And the shoe pile is a shoe pile and everybody yeah, you can't look through just go it. throwing keg shoes that you taking off horses, you know, because no. <laughs> it's not gonna fit in there. Like that's not a practice shoe, no. right? <laughs> not at you all. Know? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself, Riley? Uh, how long have you been shooting horses? Man, I. So we'll just, I'll even kick it back a little bit different. Is like, but I've been shooting horses now about twelve years, and same. Uh, 
I would be, I like. I was a team roper type guy growing up through high school, so like that led leads a lot of team ropers into shoeing horses. Competitive, competitive guys, mindset, uh, cheap guys. Uh, yeah, in general, they're you know just, what I mean, like for you, you when you team rope, you're competitive, so you want to win, right? Yeah, so super. you get that competitive side for yeah. yourself. Yeah, I've always been. I think like the, there's a good amount of horseshoers that are just already competitive. Yeah, by nature, but so I shod some horses while I was just a team roper. And so I went to horseshoeing school after I realized I was not a good employee. Like I, I was working at these different places and it was just wasn't working out yeah. for me. Always had conflicts. And usually the conflicts was a matter of like, I felt they were being lazy and not holding up their part of the bargain. And so then I would get a little upset where if you're by yourself, it doesn't even matter. It's like you get them out of you yourself. You are your own. Yeah. Yeah. It's all, it's all on your shoulder. So it was, so I went to horseshoeing school. Uh, I went to Heartland Horseshoeing School in Missouri. Like, man, like 12 years ago. Yeah. And I've just been after it ever since. Have you been back there since you went to school? Yeah. I think I've been back there twice. I went there. I got my certified there. Okay. Yeah. And then I think I went back there one other time. But yeah, that was place, about it. I've always wanted to go there and check it out and see. Uh, I mean, I know Chris and I know Cody, but I've never been to their facility. Like, it's a, It's an impressive facility. And it's just like. Man, they got to kind of figure it out, I think. And I, I don't want to say, like, in a military way, but they suck They suck you into, like, the whole aspect of the wo- the community in their world, you know? Yeah. So it's like, this is, it, it wasn't like, I'm not saying it the right way. They suck you into the lifestyle. Of being a fairy or just the lifestyle of their lives? The lifestyle of their idea of a fairy, yep. for sure. And it just so happens their lifestyle of an idea of a fairy is a hardworking fairy that makes a lot of shoes in the forge you know it's actually funny when i was on my way here driving to your house right now um i was on the phone with my brother and he's like yeah somebody uh popped up on my youtube shorts program uh feed or whatever and i was like oh really and he's like yeah it was a farrier talking to something about uh dealing with a young horse that might be needing to be trained and he's like, yeah. yeah, just some some guy cowboy hat with a uh gray handlebar mustache and i was like <laughs> Huh. Iconic, right? <laughs> well, the first thing that came to my mind was like, I know Jim Poor has a handlebar stash, you yeah. know, but I was like, he's not much of a YouTube guy. And he's like, yeah, I think it was like uh, Gregory or something. I was like, Chris Gregory. Yep. yep. So he does stand out and, yeah. Oh, man. And they just have like, I think he's got to kind of figure it out how to start a kid and like yeah. get this good base of anatomy in you, get this good base of forging in you. Yep. And of like, just all around good basic trimming you know and also like i think somebody that could go there with not a lot of horsemanship yeah he'll give him a basic of horsemanship like because it is like like a video of him doing not good horses a lot of them like it was just like you're doing school horses they're not the top trained horses and well like not all of them are that way there's going to be a gym in there but it's like for the most part you're going to get good practice of Doing one that doesn't want to be done. Yeah. (laughs) I think that's kind of important, like, when you're picking a school to go to or which one, you know, somebody that, like, well-rounded, just like you said, like, he taught you foraging, you know, taught you, like, horsemanship, and then he also introduces, like, uh, you know, the certification to you. Yeah. You know? It is a good I think there's multiple schools out there that don't really include any of that, and, Yeah. They don't, I don't think they include it, and I, I think they almost like there's some of these schools, like you, little ones. It's not, it's not something you hear on like a major level. I think the ones that you hear on a major level, you know, like <clears throat> Heartland, Five Star, uh, you know, like Wyoming, Montana, like there's some good ones out there and stuff, yeah. but it's like then there's some of these little ones that are like they're kind of teaching segregation in a way, and that's like something you majorly yeah, want to stay away right. from. It's like you want to go to a school that's not teaching segregation, that's teaching like man be good in whatever crowd you can go into just understand the horse understand where you're going and so you're not going to be embarrassed wherever you walk into yeah totally and that's i think that's like a real good lookout but it's like also get under a lot of horses yeah that's kind of important you know when you're first starting out like huge. getting underneath horses huge it's a main thing i've been shooting like there's guys that have been shooting horses for less time than me that have more apprentices than me and i purely don't take them on because i don't have that many horses yeah I do my how my business is set up of like that I run a blacksmith shop more than I shoe horses really yeah I'm making tools and making things in the forge so it wouldn't be fair to me to take on a young kid I think I'm gonna slow him up 
Yeah. Because he's not going to be under enough horses. Like Unless he was aspiring to do what you are exactly doing. Yeah, and there's not but too that's many of them. very niche. Super niche, yeah. man. It's like Let alone it's hard enough to find somebody new that wants to go just shoot horses for cheap. <laughs> they, yeah, they, it's they, hard nowadays. They're looking to make money. Yeah, and I, it's so expensive to live too. So that doesn't help either. Rightfully so. You know, like they they should be trying to make some money. Yeah. No, that was so. That was my start. Was at Heartland. I really, I really liked Heartland. Uh, but even when I went to Heartland before I left there, I remember telling Chelsea, my wife, I was like, "These guys are all into handmade shoes." And so he's like, "My first pair <laughs> of shoes I nailed on was a pair of Natural Balances is on my head horse." Like oh, he was, before you went to school? Before I went to school. Oh, okay. Yeah, man, we were... You thought you were hot shit then, too, huh? Oh, man, I was like, <laughs> I just want to make enough money that I can go to the rope and even yeah, if I lose, I get home. that's what everybody wants to, yeah, you know, that's that was, their dream. Like, the I'll plan. just learn how to shoe my own so then I can save some money. Yeah, or like, I can shoe a couple during the weekend at the rodeo yeah, and pay make for a little entry bit. Fee. Yep. yep. And so that was, man, this guy showed up and I we just shod my horse. Like, this guy had nailed on the shoes and I trimmed him. And I had this big paint horse with horrible carpitis. Yeah. And he was young, but he was just had so much heart. He could run through any pain throughout the <laughs> night, you know. And it, so it wasn't a great mix. I was an uneducated kid with a horse with a shit ton of heart and horrible confirmation. Yeah. And we had nailed on some, like, horribly shaped cake shoes on him earlier in the day. And this guy showed up and was like, hey, we just can't be doing this. Well, not that it was, like, great, but we nailed some natural balances on the horse and everything. And... I had just gotten fired from a job, so I for like trying to fight my boss, and so I was like, "Man, this horseshoeing thing like seems like a good deal. This guy's got a new truck, he's got a trailer and rig, he's out there doing this every single yeah. day." I'm like, "I th I think I want to do this," and so he even before I got kicked out of high school and stuff, so I was working with the guy's father-in-law, and I was just building horse. We were working on horse trailers and roping every day. Yeah, and so that guy told me that well, you can't really make money shoeing horses. But you can make enough for like feed yourself on the weekend and make a little bit extra. But this guy was making money. You could tell that he was like he was supplying himself with a life and his family yeah. with a life. So I was like, that seems like a good deal. So we shot my horse and everything. He sent me off to Heartland because he went to a Chris clinic and thought the guy was really good. So it was like, and I checked out some schools and it was like, man, it was good. And Chris was the first guy, first school to call me back himself. Oh wow! So it wasn't like a secretary yeah. or something like that. He that called me back. Wow. And so I, I thought, like, even as a kid, I was like, that's saying something. This guy's taking, like, yeah, control. Time. Yeah, and he's got the time for his students. He's yep. not going to be pushed to the he side. He cares, and he wants to Yeah, educate. so that's, that's where I, I went. And I told Chelsea before I left, I was like, these guys are going to try to give me handmade shoes and all this crap. <laughs> I just, I'm going to get back, and I'm going to nail cake shoes on, and I'm just going to make some money. Yeah. But I'm really just going to go here. And look at you now. Oh, <laughs> dude, All you do is handmade, right? Heartland changed, like, <laughs> either way. It was, I'm not trying to sound like cliche or whatever, but like it changed my life. Oh, yeah. Dude, opened my eye. That was the first time I saw an anvil used was at Heartland. Other than like uh, very first turning day. cams or Dude, whatever. very first day. We, like, oh, before that, I thought you flattened shoes with the hardy hole. Oh, damn. To make things so like you, you just, just always yeah. had this big old wavy Bowie <laughs> shoes on cow. there. And it was like, Dude, we, we, before I went to school, we went near this lady's barrel horse one day and she was losing shoes. This was in school? No, this was before school. Oh, and I was with the guy school. that we were, we were just roping and doing horse trailers. Yeah. And he's an old, old timer guy and just cowboy. And like, this lady was losing shoes and he's like, well, I could keep the shoes on, but it's going to deform the feet a little bit. That's what you said. Or That's he what said. he said. Okay. And I was just like, man, we were shooting, like, we, he just had a, a five gallon bucket full of shoes and a five gallon bucket of tools. <laughs> And if we showed up at your place to do something to your horse, we either going to float its teeth. Oh, dang. Geld it. Dang. Or shoe it. Those are the Jack options. Jack of all trades. It was the options, man. And he only had one single cap dodge. So it was, it was a yeah. lot crammed in that package. Yeah. And so we went back to the shop and we cut some washers in half and welded them onto the sides of the shoes as clips. Washers. Washers. I mean... They it's were not they the were, worst thing I've heard, really, but they were clips. <laughs> yeah, they were clips, and we drove those babies onto those feet, and it's, she didn't lose shoes anymore. If anything, that's kind of clever, really, dude. And so, like, <laughs> going from in that, a pinch. going from that to then all of a sudden seeing a guy like Chris and Cody Gregory, yeah, shoe a horse, you were like, yeah, I've never seen a horse shot. It was like I really don't think I know anything. So at the time, Cody, he probably was like 
just getting into like competing really heavily. This was kind of before he became like a national champion for the WCB, right? Yeah, it was like he was shooting for it then. Yeah, so he, he was, was gearing just up, just getting up to oh, it. Yeah, so, man, like, it's like prime time for looking back. I you'd feel bad, you know, it's like you're this young student walking up asking him questions all the time. Yeah, poor kids trying to practice. Yeah, and it's like, man, like I know that feeling. Should probably left him too. alone. Yeah, you know, but. When you're just trying to get work done and you're focusing on yourself and you got somebody asking you questions, I know that, yeah. Dude, yeah, and it's like, you're kind of like in the seat of like, oh, well, I paid to be here, I'm a student, but it's like, man, after hours, yeah, this guy's trying to do something too with him. He's trying to better himself, so it's Which, like... as a student, you're seeing somebody like that go forward and put the effort in, and it almost like, like dang, that's pretty cool. Like, he's it, trying to achieve a goal. It, it was impressive. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, in what he could do, mm -hmm. you know, they're like, and you would see him have such a little flaw Yeah. and go so far to try to fix that little flaw. We're like all of our whole entire shoe oh, yeah. is just so many little flaws put together well, and you were so tired too. Is like, uh, you don't necessarily know what's good or bad at that point either. So I everything mean, no, could be fantastic. Dude, you're so lost. You can tell like, damn, this is good. Yeah. Yeah, it's just like anything, man. It's like, if it looks right, it's probably right. Yeah. I mean, but at that point, you're just like, you can tell what's like right and what's crap, but you have no idea really why yeah. you're telling that. It's like, yeah. it's just why it is what it is. Yeah. 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 Exactly. It's kind of the same for me when I was in school, you know, like we'd get clinicians come in and, you know, uh, like Jake Engler would come in and like, this was like when he was you know competing at calgary he'd be tuned up or whatever so he's like probably pretty close to being on the team on yeah the yeah uh not exactly sure the years that he was on there but you know he'd come in and he'd just whip up some shoes for us and stuff and like uh i remember one time i had a smart ass like he asked like uh any requests and i was like yeah make a heart bar or something <laughs> yeah he like looked he's like man i really don't want to make a heart bar right now but <laughs> all right and then even Jeff, his dad, was like, looked over. He's like, why are you making him, you know, gave that look. But It's not like you were going to go and make a hard no, bar anytime absolutely soon. absolutely not. But, uh, you know, but he got done with it. It was freaking sick. Yeah, a cracker, man. Kind of the same like, thing, you know. Like, you see it, and you're like, god dang. So, you, I think you, me and you went to horseshoeing school about the same time frame. Well, yeah, you said you've been shooting for 12 years, and I'm on my 12th year as well. Yeah. 2010 is when I started, and then... Uh, Walla Walla Community College, where yep. Jeff Engler was a teacher, and kind of the same story. Like, I used to rodeo, so I rode bareback horses. And, you know, at the time, coming out of high school, I, uh, my main goal and dream was I wanted to be on the college rodeo team so then I can go rodeo. But to be on the team, you have to be a full time student. So I didn't really know what to study. And so I actually I tried to take the diesel mechanics course first, yeah. but they were like, you need like seven thousand dollars worth of tools by next week. And I'm like, I can't afford that. Yeah. So uh, my best friend, he was my traveling partner and uh, roommate, and he's like, you know, try the horseshoeing. You know, you might like it. So I tried the horseshoeing, and here we are, twelve years later. So did you grow up with horses? No. Not <laughs> like your family had nothing to do with horses. Uh, not until my stepdad came into our lives, and he actually. He rodeoed and stuff like that. Okay. For many years. And okay. um, was that during your high school time? Yeah. So when I was a freshman or eighth grade or so, that's when they met. And then um, we had gotten into like 4 H and FFA. And uh, we were actually, I was at the county fair in Goldendale showing my steer. I think it was like my sophomore year. And they have the rodeo there at the same time. Yeah. And we were sitting there watching the rodeo and sitting there with my stepdad. And we were, they come out with the bareback riding first. Yep. She was the first event. And I was like, Jeff, that looks freaking cool. I want to try it. He's like, you sure about that? And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And I think the fair is in August. And in January, we were headed to a rodeo school. And I was getting on bucking horses. So, so like, yeah, we're going to go away from like the shooting school thing for a little bit. So it's like. Were you into adrenaline type things before the bucking oh, horses? Yeah. Oh yeah, dirt bikes, snowboard. And... So it wasn't a matter of like you were this little four H kid that's like showing steers only. Now all of a sudden you want to step on a bucking nah. horse. That's a big jump. I mean, ever but since so I was a kid, I was 
on my dirt bike all the time, snowmobiles, whatever. Big hits, adrenaline. Like it, it yeah. looks like a blast. Oh yeah. Yeah. So okay. I think that's where the competing side, you know, fills a void for me. Competing side and like, man, kind of fits right in with the horseshoe and competing of like competing alone. Yeah. Non team sport, really. Yeah. It's an alone sport for the most part. I mean, there's some rare team events in our horseshoeing world, but it's like yeah. we're pretty much alone. And to be honest, my favorite part about horseshoeing competitions is the team event, the that's, teamed events. Either that's the funny. two man, and I haven't done a four man format with you guys or anything, but. And I wonder if that's because you grew up with that a lot. Like, and I, like I said, did you play team sports at all? Uh, man, I played basketball like once my junior year as I was on the freshman team. I wasn't very good. <laughs> yeah. But, but so uh, it wasn't like yeah. you were like really in the, like, so I wonder if that is like, it's a different at type of team sport than like high school team sports. May, it, maybe, I don't know. I, I think something for me is like, I like the, uh, the camaraderie, you know, being able to pair up with somebody and like, it's got a car driving by random <laughs> yeah it's what midnight midnight <laughs> out in the woods yeah and uh <clears throat> anyways uh i know I, I like the idea that it's you and your teammate competing against everybody else and it's like you two are you know going up against the world i guess i don't Dude, know that's what i like too is like when i'm on an individual competition I feel like it's the world stacking up against me a little bit. Yeah. And it's it's not. It's me stacking up against myself. Yeah. And it's like, but you're like, man, if I fall, I fall hard. There's By no yourself. one to pick me up. Yeah. Where on the team event, it's definitely like, I got these three other guys that they're trying to help me stay on the boat. Yeah. The whole entire time. But they're also counting through. on you as well. They, they are counting on you. You got to do your part of rowing. But you're also counting on them. In high school team sports, it's a different aspect everybody's competing against each other even on the same team a little bit yeah i mean when you're in practice even i mean everybody's yeah. trying to like start yeah so everybody's gunning for each other the whole entire time you know totally. where it's like you don't get that no one's gun. there's we all got our own foot we're all starting yeah it doesn't matter anymore like yeah they're like especially on our team we're the, all uh, like a little hierarchy, chosen hierarchy or however you say that you know yep and I, I think they like there's probably a little bit more of that on the higher end teams you know but it also probably comes with maturity definitely you know as you become an older man you know you're growing up like you can start to set aside your ego a little bit you know you're maturing a little bit you're maturing a lot more oh yeah so I think uh, the biggest thing that gets in a lot of people's way, like in general, I think is just people's egos. Dude, it's, you know, w w even in our world of the, the shoe in teams is like egos are huge. And yeah. it's just like, especially and it's, y you realize it when you step outside of that world for a little bit, you get lost in it. So it's when well, you go on Facebook and the only thing you see is people's ego, like getting mad. Gee, Russian dumb thing, and they all think they're coming at you with constructive criticism. It's yeah. like, though, you know what you should have done. The whole yeah. thing is like, no, man, not get even in if the it's... arena. Show me what I should yeah. have done. <laughs> it doesn't have to even pertain to like horseshoeing, you know. No, Just... it's anything. It's... Nobody wants to be wrong anymore, you know. No, it's crazy. Well, I think that's like the team is everybody's doing the same work. Yeah, too. So it's like it, it, you can't really get on each other about like. Oh, he's not doing his part. He's not doing his part. It's like, well, yeah, we're all freaking here. We're all doing the same part. So yep. it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Like, it, but it's hard too, is like you get around a bunch of guys and just ho competitive horseshoers in general, they all accept cr like creative criticism better than the general public. Totally. Cause you're all trying to get better. You yes. know, you are signing up to basically be, I don't know, criticized, right? You are. You're <laughs> like, man, put, Put a number on me. Yeah. I, I want you a money. number. I'm giving you money to criticize me. To put me on a standing. Yeah. Like, it doesn't matter how you think of it. It's like you're paying yeah. to get ranked. Whether I'm going to be first or last. Yep. It don't Show matter. me where I lie. Yep. I, wanna, I need to know where I lie. It's a crazy concept that, you know, we as humans do that. Oh, my, yeah. You know? but, but it's, and it's something you fully can't explain to somebody either why you do it like it's hard yeah so you're I get like clients well, that ask doing me all the time to get like, better you know yeah. and it's like it's as simple and as complicated as that answer yeah. i get clients that ask like why do you do it like you know but it's also like well, well yeah i'm getting better as a farrier to help your horse and help you you know yeah. but it's also 
feeding aside in me. Oh, it's you know, therapy. the competitive. It, it's therapy. It's church, man. It's it's like everything all wrapped up in one. You you're feeding that competitive little rush. You get ranked with everybody. You get the camaraderie even more, even at yeah. the individual competitions. You get around your kind. Because if you think, like, I'm not a great numbers guy, but I think about it as, like, as many horseshoers as there are in the country and only 100 or so go to, like, say, the WCB, that's about 1%, I bet. Yeah. So, like, we kind of are the one percenters, so you get near your own blood. The Hell's Angels. Yeah, it's like, yeah, the, the, the club, it's like, they're, they're like, they think like you think a little bit more, so you yep. can kind of express your, and you can throw some constructive criticism, around, and like, you can get it. Yeah. You can get it and know it's not coming from a wicked place. But I think you also, you need to clarify the one percenter thing, because that could actually drive people away thinking, you know, these are a group of guys, you know, they're just walking around boasting their chest. You know, a lot of people think that. Yeah. But yeah. really, you know, we're trying to invite people to come in, you know, because we're all out to help each other. It's, you know? dude, I, yeah, I agree. I remember going to my first contest and thinking, like, I was so nervous just to work in front of everybody and not even just work in front of everybody, meet everybody. Yeah. I remember it, that it, too. It is. It's like, I mean, you see, especially with like, I bet it was, e I don't know if it's easier back then. I guess you're walking to the unknown, but it's like with social media, you, you know, these big names yeah. and everything. And like you show up and you see them, you're like, oh man, you're pretty nervous to meet them yeah. and everything. But they turn out to be these super cool guys yeah. that all they want is to make everybody better. Yeah. And so I don't, I don't want to like say it's the one percenters as far as like we're a club and you can't get in. No. It's, it's the one percenters of like, I do think it's a certain mindset that yeah. stays yeah. and is around for a while because it is a, like not everybody is ready to hear the bad things about themselves. Yeah. Nobody wants to hear that. Like generally speaking, it's, it's just, it's so easy to stay away from yeah. in today's world. And I don't even like, I don't want to try to say the world, but it's like, it's easy to stay away from in general. So like, to be wanting to pay to go somewhere to get this constructive criticism, you know, and to like try to build yourself as a person mm -hmm. is pretty rare. I think it is a, a rare person that d goes and does these things. Yeah. Especially when there's options out there to go to clinics that aren't going to rank you. Yeah, totally. They're going to put everybody in one group picture at the end. Everybody did good, man. It was a great time, <laughs> man. Everybody drank the same amount of coffee. Yeah. Like it was, it was excellent. It's very true. So to go to the, to choose to go to the one, yeah, I think that's a lower percentage of person that's going to go there. I don't, I don't think it's a group to go into. I think it's just a, a, a person that's going to head that way. Yeah. And it sounds like yeah, you've kind of been that person even through we're out the world no matter what you were going to get into because you can even ride dirt bikes and you can do the same thing never get ranked yeah but you you like still now you choose to go to races and yeah. stuff yeah i enjoy it you know and it's fun you know it's something different it changes yeah. it up because but it's funny like no matter what world you step into you're still going to step into a competitive side of it where you're like that's just i want to get better at this. me yeah yeah so that's it just is, me it's a trip man yeah i mean it could be something as simple as knitting you know if i wanted to get into knitting i'm gonna be like okay was there a knitting competition like how do i get better how yeah. do i become the best knitter you Dude, know that was that yeah i think it is just a type of person that we are and most competitors are and especially if like when you go to certain competitions it's gonna bring that certain type of guy like yeah. and so it is good and around it's like if you just hang out in the local world like man it's it's easy to think like maybe i'm the weirdo Maybe yeah. I'm the oddball, you know, <laughs> but then you go to this bigger world, like where there's more people from all around and like the like-minded folk, the like-minded folk. And you all of a sudden you're like, man, I'm not that weird. No, this I'm is okay. Fitting right in. Yeah. This, I have a place here and this is all right. I fitting can keep right driving in. through this yeah. completely. Yeah. Well, I think something that'd be pretty cool, you know, through this podcast is, you know, talking to other people other than farriers, you know. Maybe we can get on the line with some electricians or a carpenter or pipe fitter, you know, other tradesmen. Yeah. You know, I think it'd be cool to hear their perspective and what it is like in their world that, you know, drives them to either one, become better, you know, because yep. I have friends like in those kind of worlds that, 
you know, basically started as apprentices and now they are journeymen, yeah. you know, at their level or whatever. And it is something also I'd like to learn, like how that, you know, whole system works too, you know? Yeah. I, I think it's a good idea, to, especially for us of like, we don't have that regulation in our world. No, but we do kind of have a system in place for like us, like, you know, like we, uh, we know like, oh, to get our certification, we go through the AFA, you get your certified, yeah. yada, 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 you become a journeyman. And then there's also other ones, you know, associations or whatever, but it w- it's interesting to me to figure out how that works, you know, for other trades. Yeah. And I think even in those other trades, there's those guys out there, they stick out and they kind of push through it. Yeah. Those are the dudes I, I would like to hear how they talk about, like, because it's pretty easy in those worlds to just get lost in the mundane. Yeah. The but then there's those random day. people that, man, they still, like, they're pushing. Yeah. No matter what, even if they don't have to. No yeah. one's pushing them, but they're they're going. Working for the man, basically, too. <laughs> yeah. You know, so. Oh, completely. How, like, yeah, to figure out how are you able to do that every day, you know, versus us working for ourselves. Yeah. You know, it's, it's an interesting I don't know mindset really yeah it really is like what drives them is it the money you know yeah yeah it's a, it's a different it's a different head than we are i think a little bit because yeah like I, like what i said earlier, i'm not employable like in the matter of like i can't really have a boss that's that doesn't work for me yeah but some I mean, guys, you probably could if you tried hard enough and you were that desperate or you that yeah, had to. I, oh, but, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. But it's like I just right don't. Right now, you don't feel the need to. No. And it's, and, but it's like there's other guys who like they thrive with co-management. Yeah. And with like other co- people. Yeah. Dude, man, they like they kind of have a boss and like but it's not even really a full boss. Like and they, they thrive really well with them. Yeah. I mean, Let's a take pause. a little pause break. Yeah. So. So you went through all the road, like, so you went through the Walla Walla program with Jeff Engler and it's during that time that we first met each other. Yeah. So one thing that Jeff actually was really good about that I think is a really great teacher is like he implemented the certification system and Jeff, he was on the American Farriers team and stuff before. So he had a competing background as well. And that's what introduced me into the competing and, you know, ultimately got me into the certification process and trying to get my CF right away and stuff. And yeah, the first time we met, actually, I was just getting ready to graduate shoeing school and they host a uh, certification there or they did at the school, Yeah, you know, every fall or whatever. And I think that's when I met you for the first time. Well, no, I don't even think we met at the Walla Walla certification. I th- we met at an Oregon certification. Really? Yeah. So it wasn't with the school. It was down, man, I think it was down in Grants Pass. Oh, um, the Eagle, Eagle, Eagle Point. Yeah. So you had already taken a portion of. Yeah. So you must have had to go down to Eagle Point to try so to finish that- it up. That was after shoe in school. Okay. Yep. That was so after we, school. So we met at Eagle Point because it was almost like, man, here comes these two guys just out of horseshoe in school, <laughs> same age. Both of us are driving little Danger Rangers. Yeah, the old Power Ranger. Yeah, <laughs> man. We got little canopies, yeah. all those things. Like, we are horseshoers Ready now. To <laughs> take right. over the world. Man, our cards say hot, cold, and corrective. <laughs> yeah, they <laughs> totally did, too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Free from hoof prints, man. Yeah. Like, free 500. Oh, and you can't forget the therapeutic on there, too. Oh, yeah, <laughs> man. I can hot, do it all. Hot, cold, and therapeutic. Whatever you want. Yeah. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> so we come rolling. Both of us not even knowing each other me the certification so we ended up like talking and hanging out the whole other time like watching each other work you know like you you there's a little bit of that competitiveness even in certification it's oh, not yeah. a competition but you're oh, like yeah. let me see what this guy's We're got young guns you know thinking yeah like oh i'm gonna boast my chest a little bit show them what i got and so it's like kind of like a known thing like once you go to certifications like the biggest pain of the whole entire certification <laughs> is getting someone to hold your horse yeah no one has old horses no. it's cold they're usually in a cold time of year yep. they're in a cold arena or yep. hot and it's like baking one or the other. yeah it's never good it takes a long time one extreme like, to the other and it's just boring as hell and it's like you can already like the person you're holding the horse for is stressed out so you're like man i don't want to be here yeah. this guy i don't want to ruin this guy's <laughs> go or anything but 
So like, this story's funny. <laughs> I, I, I'm like, oh, this. I've been hanging out with this guy. He seems pretty cool. I'm like, hey, Gavin, you want to hold my horse for me? <laughs> and Gavin just instantly cool, looks at me, cool as a cucumber. He's like, sorry, man. Not really my thing. <laughs> <laughs> just turns and walks yeah. away. So I had to pay some young barn girl like 20 bucks <laughs> to hold my horse. Well, at least she got some money out of the deal. <laughs> yeah. You didn't offer to pay me. No. <laughs> So that was like our first intro to each other. But man, it's like pretty funny how it goes. You just like your roads just keep on. Yeah. And here we are, you know, 12 years later, Bumping starting a back podcast into each together. Other. So it wasn't that much longer either that you bounced off to Texas. Well, actually, um, so once I graduated shoe in school, um, I was fixing to move into an apartment with my friend Matt McGann. And yep. I was going to start a business in the Tri-Cities. Well, he ended up breaking his femur riding bulls like a week before we were uh, going to go sign the lease on this place. So Matt's dad, Paul McGann, he lives over in Moscow, Idaho. And he was like, well, you guys can just come live with me. And then, uh, Gavin, you can apprentice with me. You know, he was a journeyman farrier okay. and stuff. So I actually, um, so straight out of shoeing school, went to go live with Paul. And then I apprenticed with him. And then also, once Matt got done with surgery, I went and shot his horses for him. So I was. So Matt already had a. Did Matt go to Matt, school with you? He was. Uh, he graduated in 2009 or 10. So he got out when I started. Okay, so but he had he still, a book of horses though, or yeah. Some. So he had two years of picking up horses in the Tri Cities, and he lived in Walla Walla. So that's how I got to know him. And he'd come by the shoeing school and stuff, and became pretty good friends through that and uh yeah so right out of school i was introduced to apprenticing for paul and then when matt was feeling good enough we would go tackle his whole week's worth of horses in three days and granted at the time when you're in school in school you might chew a whole horse yeah mate you know so oh, here dude, i am you two in a day at school is oh, like it was brutal got after it and we were doing like six seven eight a day <laughs> i was doing six seven like he was he couldn't barely move like he had surgery on his femur you know couldn't bear oh. any weight on it or nothing and uh so between working with paul and then another guy uh, Wiley McMurtry. Yep. He lived over there in Clarkston. So if Paul didn't have a day or something, uh, I would actually go down and I'd go work with Wiley. And Wiley's a journeyman too. And yep. was Wiley an assistant teacher at Walla Walla when you were there? He wasn't an assistant then, but he would come in actually with Paul. And actually, I think he might have came in with Brian once and they just do like clinics. Okay. You know, do cool. a demo for the day or whatever. So that's that is how the one nice thing about Washington is like as a whole. It's like it's a pretty involved state as far as like the school and the association and yeah. stuff. And there's some guys in there that are really willing it's to like a, It's help a bummer out. that the school has now shut down at the community college. Yeah. You know, because it was the only kind like it in the United States that you would get an associate's degree. Yeah, from it. no, you were going to college. And I think yeah. you also got like, uh, uh, you probably got a college experience. Oh, I love that part. Yeah, that was great. We're like, my experience was like, dude, we stayed in a bunkhouse in Podunk, yeah. Missouri. Yeah. yeah. There was no college experience no. there, like at all. No. But it also, that's why I guess you could say it took me two years to get through shooting school. Yeah. But it, but at that age, man, that's not going to hurt. Oh, yeah, I wouldn't trade. I mean, I loved going to college. It was fun. Yeah. You know, we had a lot of fun. And then I was college rodeo at the same time, too. And yeah. No, I think it was a great setup of a school. It's a sad thing that they, they yeah, kind of the passed The facility it down. itself was top notch. Like, it was oh, super nice. Crazy nice. Yeah. So, you did. So, how many years were you, did you stay in the Northwest? Uh, so, once I got done with uh, like Paul and Wiley, um, I was in the Tri Cities for about like two years and I actually set up a business for myself. Okay. And then I'd kind of gotten to the point where I thought I can do better and I want to get better and there's more out there. And then, uh, actually an opportunity came up from Derek cook down in Texas in Weatherford and he was seeking out an apprentice and yeah. then, you know, through Facebook or whatever, uh, it's, you know, I've seen he posted a lot of cool stuff. Like was that kind of your exposure to like that there's something better out there with social media? Yeah, you know, seeing other guys post stuff. Yeah, you know? so you were like, this is the... I was like, there's more more than what I'm doing, you know? Yeah. Like, I want to get to a point... Well, one, the Tri-Cities is kind of an area where 
it's a lot of backyard horses. You know, oh, there yeah. isn't necessarily a discipline of like you know English or Western or no, anything. they just got horses. Yeah, exactly. And I kind of always wanted to see myself, you know, working in nice barns. Like you're always working out there in the in the shit, basically. Yep. And I, and it's 110 degrees there in the summer. Oh, hot, I'm miserable. Like, yeah. <laughs> so I uh, I wanted to go get better. I wanted to get my journeyman. So um, I flew down to Texas, met Derek, stayed there for a week or a couple of days or whatever, and um, all I thought it was great. And like I thought it was going to be a great experience. And I actually a month later I ended up moving down to weatherford texas and moving in with Derek, yeah and uh started a i get i would consider it like an advanced apprenticeship because he the things we did together in the shoeing business like i would ne i didn't necessarily do that with paul or wiley like it was pretty cool like i was be Derek did a lot of handmaids so okay Derek would almost be trimming the feet and then i would be building the shoes Okay. So, nice. Uh, he would trim the feet. I'd come over, get measurements, and then uh, I'd cut it, build the shoes that we needed, and which is huge. Yeah. To be able to build shoes to a guy that knows how to trim feet. Yeah. Totally. Because like, you don't know how to trim feet when you're first learning how to build shoes, so you're kind of building shoes to what you think yeah. your store should be trimmed. Yeah. That ideal shape or oh whatever. Oh my god! Like, you know how to make it. At spade. the time, like you're you're getting the AFA template, right? Yeah. That's so you're all thinking you that is like ideal. It, no, you literally get in your head is like the tighter the toe. On the Heinz? Yeah, the better. better. Like, <laughs> I can get that. that you're, you're bending on like, the yeah. point of the horn. Get, yeah, it's basically a triangle. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. It looks horrible. So then when a guy trims some feet for you that you're like, oh, toes are a little broader. And that's a cool thing also is like working with somebody that knows how to trim feet. So you're seeing lots of feet being trimmed well. You know, and so you nice feet down in Texas, probably they're holding a together a little bit better. Yeah, a lot of corridors, but in the Tri Cities, the same way, dry oh, okay. desert, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, so then my main goal working with Derek was I wanted to get my journeyman, and he helped me get that like within the first like two months of me being there. Really, I mean, that was my like that's what we did was just shoe horses. He'd let me do journeyman runs, like if he had like an old uh campaigner horse or whatever and be like hey you can do a journeyman run on this horse and yeah do a couple journeyman runs a week and uh that's yeah. big yeah i mean i passed like the uh practical part like the first try but the uh written different story yeah took me a few of, times it could be kind of confusing yeah <laughs> a little bit. it's not a strong suit of mine but i'm working <laughs> on it i work on it no but it's so like but it's also texas is just a honey hole Dude, of the good horseshoers. community there in Weatherford was one of the best things. Like, I had Robert Jukes, Paul Keller, and Derek Cook. We, like, lived within a 30-minute radius. Huge. So, like, we were either going over to Derek's place and practicing, or we were, you know, four or five nights a week, we were at Paul's shop practicing. Man, yeah, and, like, at that same time, like, Paul was going to WCBs. Robert, Robert was really gunning was, up like the first year or two before robert got on the team so like he was really coming in climbing up the ranks yeah he was whipping ass yeah and and doing a lot of laboratory shit yeah trying to figure it out i bet yeah it was sweet so it's cool I got to, to see do it right there with him yeah you know? and then uh i'd also go shoe horses with robert because uh, i was trying to pick up some horses on my own and stuff too and working yeah. with whoever i could you know yeah and just trying to man like you said you were just like definitely express leaning yeah I, you're learning i jumped in the truck with whoever i could whenever i could when i had the days like uh going with tj boudreau he would uh tell me like yep be at the house two in the morning we got to be the first stop by 3 a.m but this is in the summertime when it's hot okay and then yeah. we'd be done by seven you know but we'd get through 20 by then Jeez. it is crazy <laughs> and then uh yeah like jake whitman and you know a bunch of different guys no, it's Jake Engler, and it's a crazy world down there. Yeah, compared to like up, up you here. know, yeah, Every, we're all like kind of like spread out, you know, like you're we're five hours out. from me. Yeah, right? we're spread out, and it's just like a little bit different scene. Even just like you know, you go to a local competition up here, it might be ten guys. Yeah, man, you go to Texas's competition, big, huge, big, huge, and big names. Yeah, like it is some gunners. I there. mean, I've even flown down there from washington to go compete there because i thought it was 
pretty sweet. Yeah, it is a cool, cool competition. And they got the draft shoeing. Yes. Not many out there, you know, nowadays with the draft shoeing still in it. So no, it's pretty dra- sweet. Yeah, three man draft shoeing. Yeah, you do a pretty side. decent horses. Like, yep. it's no, it's a it's, it's a real deal. I. It's crazy to think that there was a lot of state competitions. Not a lot, but there was more of them that were like that. You yeah. know, that people were traveling and yeah. carrying all their gear around. Yeah, that thing, that's kind of like faded now, huh? A little bit. Like, it's I th- it's still alive some, you know? Texas is still a big show. Yeah. But as far as, like, going to, like, different states and competing, I guess, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, if- I've... I haven't traveled personally. Like I'm, I'm still new to this war to the horse shoeing world. Twelve years, so it's like compared to other guys. So, but it's like I, I wasn't a part of that. Yeah, true. I've made, I've driven down two states, you know, with all my gear. Yeah. To go compete. Yep. Other than that, it's a plane ticket. True. I've flown a, I've flown a bunch. That's the handy thing about the WCB. Is Craig like, has made it they got so that simple. It. Yeah. You know, to compete. And to compete against a bunch of other people all around. Yeah. Well, we just get to hop on a plane with a little Pelican case. Yeah. And Hopefully you're under 50 pounds. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and go, it's and so go hard like, to do that too. Oh, it's so hard. It's like, I, I rarely get it under 50. I always yeah. end up having to have split it yeah. and have two Pelicans full of tools. <laughs> it's a pain. It's oh, a pain. It's a worth. But it's worth it. How long? So how long do you stay in Texas for? Oh, uh, shoot. So I think I moved back up to Washington in like 2016. Yeah, 2016 because I've lived up here for six years now. So, yeah. So and I was down there for a few years. So you, you, when you moved up here, you moved up here to take on another business for a farrier. Yeah. Uh, we started in for like a multi-farrier practice. Okay. And uh, not real thrilled about the way it went, but yeah. Had differences. Yeah. But it was, yeah, you weren't just coming back just to come back. Uh, you or know, you, you ready to get out of Texas. You kind of did what you needed to do down there, what you went for. Yeah. Kind of one thing I started, I guess I started missing home. Home to me is Washington, you know, and there's yeah. certain aspects that I like about it up here. And, uh, kind of one thing I got tired of chewing was quarter horses. Really? Yeah. I don't really like chewing quarter horses anymore. Tight, short, little. They're irritating dudes tight horses to work on you know like i shoot a lot of bigger horses now so you know they're limber like you don't gotta squat down on your knees and no they are yeah big horses are way easier to yeah shoot. i agree so that's kind of one thing that enticed me to uh come back up here really it's yeah. just a tight you- just i wanted to get into a different environment of horses really that's you know? wild man. and Moving up here to do that multi deal, multi farrier deal was uh, like kind of an invitation to get, step into that, you know. Because it is what something like even you said before you left to Texas that you wanted to get into the bigger barns and the nicer stuff. And well, like here in the Northwest, that means jumpers, that means eventers, yeah. that means big horses, dressage horses. Yep. Yeah, like you got to ride, you got to be doing English horses to get yep. into the real nice barns. Like, they, I'm not saying there's not Western barns like that. You know, that, one thing but, that was crazy about like Texas is like they have a ton of uh, big barns and Weatherford area. I mean, it's the uh, cotton horse capital of the world. Yeah. So, um, but those guys. So you, a lot of those cutting horses are headed to a fraternity. So they're you're shooting them at two years old, three years old, you know. So they're pretty young horses, but yep. they are being rode a lot. So they are fairly broke, but they are running a business. So um, they don't necessarily they want they kind of want it done quick, cheap, right? Yeah. You know, there was oh, only completely. a certain. Uh, you know, working with Robert was pretty sweet because we would he would do a pretty dang good job and he get fairly well compensated for it so yeah. versus some other guys you know like get them in get them out get them done cranking you know? through them and as a new guy starting out like that's what they're wanting is the guy to get them in get them out G- yeah hard to keep cheap. up with that yeah let's see that's not what you're trying to do yeah exactly so what coming back home was like a pretty good step into like what you're wanting to do a whole new yeah discipline of horses really Man. And granted, you know, being down there, like I did, you know, working with a couple guys in some English barns or whatever, but, um, to do that, I actually, I would have to travel to go work for them. You know, I'd have to drive an hour and a half, two hours really before, you know, to go work for them. And then, then we would be kind of into a different discipline of horses, but yeah. So then coming home was just completely. Yeah. And I didn't necessarily want to move. Like I had developed some friends there in Weatherford. Yep. 
I didn't want to have to go move another two hours away, right? Yeah. And almost start over, I guess. And if you're moving, you're moving. Yeah. It's not like I have family down in Texas or anything like that. So no. Yeah. Just came on home. Yeah. Yeah, it's been great. And then my mom, she lives up here too, so that was helpful. Yeah. And now, now you got a lady, and so you got a relationship going. Yeah, I've been uh, with Ashley now for a couple of years now. Time flies, dude. Dude, yeah, it goes pretty damn quick. How long have you and Chelsea been together? Me and Chelsea got together in high school. Dang. So we've been together, <clears throat> like, I think like 16 years or 15 years or that's something almost, like that. That's like half your life, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what we were thinking the other day. That like We've pretty much been together for half of our lives. That's crazy to think about. Yeah, it, and it's a it's a weird thing. It's like, man, it's like, yeah, I met Chelsea my seventeenth birthday. She came <laughs> to my birthday party. Wow! And because we didn't go to the same schools or anything, like we probably wouldn't have crossed paths anyways. And it's probably a good. Oh, you didn't even go to the same school? No, which was good. Yeah. Because I was not a good kid. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, I grew up with like, man, I just had anger issues, and like, one thing is like one thing about me is like. I don't forgive easy. I give up like on someone pretty quick. Like it, do, it doesn't take much to lose my trust. Yeah. And it's like, but also it's like, man, if I do trust you, like I'm pretty damn loyal to you. Yeah. And so I never got in a fight for myself, but it's like I got in quite a few fights for buddies Dang. and stuff. So it was like, Maybe I wasn't. that's why we get along because I'm not a fighter. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not anymore. <laughs> it's like, you learn pretty quick. There's like way better ways to handle life. Yeah. But it's like. It was good because Chelsea probably, if she went to school with me, she probably wouldn't have talked to me yeah, really. Yeah, she'd be like, this guy's psycho. Yeah, but she didn't go to school with me, so she gave me a chance. Yeah. And it was like, well, now, like, yeah, we just hung Looked out you guys throughout now. there. Half yeah. your life and your best friends. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's you guys been... got a nice little daughter now? Yep, yeah, we got a little little daughter almost three years old hanging out out here. I can't believe she's already three. Dude, just it just flies through the whole entire thing, man. But it's, it's it's like, and also she's been through there through the whole entire, like Chelsea has, like me becoming a part, you know, like a man, a, a man, not even a man, but it's like, man, learning how to be a business and stuff. And like, she's just as part of this as anything else, you know, yeah. it's like, she does help you out quite a bit from huge, what I hear. Right? Yeah. It's like, she, she's, she is the drive through half of this. I would probably like, Oh, the IRS a million dollars. Like you just, yeah. like, I've never paid taxes well, to this you'd, point. Like, you probably wouldn't want to be the one shipping stuff out and stuff oh, like yeah, that. I'd be right? horrible about it. Yeah. You know, it's like, I just want to make the thing and forget about it. Well, yeah. she makes that kind of possible. Mm hmm. But it is like our, uh, the self-employed world is not great for relationships always. Yeah. And so it's like super hard to communicate that. Yeah. But it's like, I'm kind of lucky that she understands each part of it because she saw it happen. Yeah. Where it's like, I'm sure it's even hard for you sometimes that you got to explain some things that like, and not even explain, but it's like, just like she's not a she didn't she's stepping into this horseshoeing world you know of like probably the and she's not a horse lady either so. even people that have horses like really i don't think they understand what the heck's going on sometimes yeah you know true. or what they think our life is really like or how much it really then again we are takes. kind of a i guess you can consider a different breed of horseshoers or farriers for our area you know yeah and just in general and like so that's even a hard thing to try to explain to somebody you know it's like I, like Chelsea gets it, but other people don't get it. And like, even like other people in my family don't get it. They're like, well, why do you do all this? You know, it's like trying, yeah. my dad never understood really, you know, like he gets it a little bit more now, but it's like, why are you spending all this time making these shoes? Yeah. You know, these guys just buy these shoes and nail yeah. them on. You could be making more money. Yeah. And he's like, so he just didn't really like fully understand it. So it's like, and like we said earlier, it's not something you can just easily explain to somebody why you're out there torturing yourself. Somebody uh, just commented that on like one of my YouTube videos. He's like, why did you build the shoe and like not just go buy it? Yeah. You know? So it's, it's like, like, that's not what I, it's not what it's about. It's just not what I'm doing, man. Yeah. It's not, it's like, yeah, this might be like, we could explain some like financial part of it or whatever, you know, that it could like, well, in the end, it's worth it to me. Yeah, it's gratifying to me. It's accomplishing something within myself, you know. So it's hard. Yeah, it's hard to explain to somebody that that's why you're you're doing it, but that's why you're doing it. So it's like new people coming in out of your life. You have to try to communicate that to them. Man, yeah, it's it's rough. Yeah, but it hit, has been hitting on your YouTube. So that's kind of what you're. 
you've yeah. been f- focused on right now it's like yeah so, you haven't been competing uh, as much yeah i've kind of been stepping up taking a step back i guess from the competing now for well once COVID hit or whatever, then pretty much everything stopped, right? Yep. And that kind of sucked because that's kind of when I was starting to just get into my groove of things where, you know, I was able to place in the top 10 at the WCB for the year end. And then my next goal was I wanted to be up even higher than that. Yeah, you want to be on the team. following year. Yeah, you know, or maybe in two years from that point. But then COVID hit and basically everything stopped. Yep. And that kind of did take the wind out of my sails a little bit, like with all the uh, masks and whatever. Blah, oh, blah, blah. travel is yeah. pretty rough. So I uh, started riding my dirt bike a lot more. You know, you could do that. Like you can go be in the woods or whatever. And yeah. yeah. So, and I guess now I just kind of been trying to think of something else to do that I could be good at. And I think this is something new for me to learn how to, you know, try to entertain an audience through what we do and yeah and i want to do that through youtube that is that is an interesting way to look at it i guess it's in that i i haven't really talked to you about this either so if like so you you aren't necessarily even doing it for like which is where i come from sometimes and it's hard it's like you're trying to come from an education standpoint sometimes but you're coming from a a more entertainment standpoint and not even trying to entertainment standpoint towards horseshoers. A little bit of both, I guess, you know, I kind of, you know, I don't want to necessarily make it all about education, Yeah. but I don't necessarily want to make it all about entertainment. You know, I don't think, um, sometimes I don't think I'm like a super funny guy or anything. Like I'm usually a, if there's a job in front of me, I get it done and I can figure that out and how to do it. Yeah. And sometimes I don't think, uh, you know, I'm not very, uh, entertaining so that's why i kind of include a little bit of both in there you know and you know i'm not trying to gear it necessarily towards farriers or towards non-farriers you know or horse owners or whatever you know kind of want to uh get a whole horizon of people i guess for you know just for them to see what we go through and the steps we have taken you know to become who we are yeah and that's and there, there's a lot of steps and it's like saying like they don't really know what's going on on the horseshoe in front yeah and a lot of people don't even know that we still exist yeah it's, we're what the oldest trade in the world other than prostitution right yeah but it's funny how many people you go somewhere and they're like oh that's what you do for a living you yeah. don't hear that much anymore and you think like man you probably drove by five of them to yeah. work this morning yeah like they just don't know what their rigs look like no they're all over the dang place yeah um Shoot, I lost my train of thought there. Yeah, that's uh, don't worry. On your YouTube. Um, yes. Yeah, so, basically, the channel is Pacific Northwest Farrier Show, and yeah, if you guys want to just see some content as far as like farrier world or farrier life, you know, that's I don't see anybody else on there right now. You know, that is uh, kind of doing what we do. You know, as far as like competing and stuff. Like, granted, I'm not necessarily competing. Like, you guys are doing the four man team, but you guys are my friends and I know you pretty well. And that's kind of why I want to take the role as far as like trying to show an audience or the world, I guess, what goes into this. You know, it's not necessarily like we were talking with the ego thing. It's not just a bunch of guys getting together, trying to pump their chests up, you know? No. Like, you are trying to help each other get better you know it's a team aspect you know and i kind of want to try to show that you know uh through videos i guess no i think that's it's great and that is it's a it's a world of the horse like like not a lot of people know but most people know kind of what generally is going on the horseshoeing but it's like the dude that's getting up extra early in the morning or staying out extra late night in the shop yeah practicing for the shoes that are never even going to see a horse yeah you know that that is a different different aspects and reach into it which is pretty funny how like life really just down these whole entire channels of like you know we met each other there you kind of bumped away for a little bit you went to texas but we still hung out at different wcbs and stuff yeah and then now back here we are again but it's funny if like the if you i don't think if you wouldn't have started the youtube channel we wouldn't be doing the podcast probably not and honestly uh it's kind of funny uh like two years ago uh, for my birthday, my youngest brother 
like he's a big computer whiz i guess and uh one year he's like i got this computer i built uh, i'm gonna give it to you for your birthday and at the time i was like what the hell am i gonna use a computer for <laughs> yeah. you know like i don't use a computer you know and from that day he gave me that computer from that day i've pretty much used that computer every day you know whether i'm trying to learn how to edit videos or just other things that i try and do you know outside of horseshoeing and stuff it's funny man how you get a little nugget dropped on you that you're yeah, like yeah like i yeah <laughs> like what the hell am i gonna do with this thing and now it's actually you know it's opened up a whole nother i guess i don't know if you could say chapter or whatever but like a whole nother thing i've been interested in and you know try to get better at oh know? definitely like i and i like it is a a thing of like i would have never stepped into the podcast world yeah if i wouldn't had somebody that's gonna take on kind of a little bit more of those parts and like yeah. help me out because it's like man i'm pretty that's the same thing when you when we were here when i was here a couple of weeks ago at your house and you came up to me like dude we should start a podcast and i was like dude i've been thinking about this for a while now it's just fate that you just came to me it was yeah. funny yeah i was just in the house man taking going in there get a drink came back like it was there like why wouldn't we just start one? Yeah. Like we were out here talking about what we want to hear people talk about. It's like, let's get we might as it. well jump into it. Yeah. Just and a so, little bit more work on our plates, but yeah. that's fine. And I think, so like here we are kind of throwing ourselves out there. Me and Gavin don't come from a computer background really. Yeah, so there might be some growing pains. We don't fully come from a radio background or an entertainment no. background even. Yeah. And it's like... I don't know, like, I, man, growing up, like, I love radio shows. I live for morning radio. Yep. I love Howard Stern. Yeah. Like, I, I, I do. I love, like, obviously, who doesn't like, like, Joe Rogan and stuff like that. Like, so it is always been interesting to me, and I've wanted to do it, but, like, we're going to have some struggles. We're going to suck sometimes on yeah. this stuff. Like Embrace the suck, as they say, man, right? But I think we're, t we're two guys. It's like, this is what we do. Like, we're a little bit of like, man, I hate to be cliche, you're like Instagram me right now, but it's like, we're students of life. Yeah. No matter what thing we jump into, we're there to learn and we're there to try to figure it out. So if everybody like kind of jumps in there with us, man, maybe we might have a fall down week, but man, come in the next time or so. Like the next episode might be a little bit better and we're going to kind of keep on trying to climb with this deal. Uh we're going to try to bring some guests in and like Gavin said we're going to reach outside of our farrier world yeah so i guess we are just going to have a little bit of growing pains uh if you're watching us on youtube you're obviously seeing that uh the view has changed and our recorder changed or our recorder died on us so now we are both at our homes and doing the podcast now so we've actually we were talking about um who we've been wanting to get on the podcast. So that's what we've been kind of going through and figuring that out. So. Yeah. And we, we want to hear from everybody else. We don't want to like, obviously we're going to get on the podcast who we want to be on it and who we want to talk to. Yeah. And that's more than likely going to be like a lot of our friends and people that we've just met through our travels or people we've heard of, <clears throat> but we want to hear from you guys who you guys want to hear about. And kind of what you want to hear about. Uh, just kind of keep in mind, like, this isn't really super educational. Like, you know, like, this is this is a little bit of a different deal. Uh, we're going to cover some educational things. We're going to hear what people want to, like, say about their shoeing. But we want to talk. We want to hear about people's lives and how they make this work and how they make being a tradesman and their own boss and just working every day and running businesses works so if you have somebody in mind that that hits uh, i suppose if, get a hold of us if somebody did want to go into detail and talk about trim and feet and all that stuff i mean by all means get into it but yeah i'd love to hear it <laughs> yeah yeah i mean because a lot of time that's like man that does tie up with who you are as a person yeah. sometimes you know, some, <laughs> like, there's people the out there like that you know but we have so we got an instagram going right now it's called forging brains podcast you could find us on there. Send us a DM. Uh, it's an easy way to get a hold of us. You could try to get a hold of me and Gavin on our own personal po Instagrams as well. Gavin can be found at Pacific Northwest Farrier Show. I'm just at Patrick Forge. Uh, to be honest, 
you're going to get lost in the message request probably. Yeah. So if the best bet is to just get it on to the Foraging Brains podcast yep. and Instagram, send us a message on there. Yep. Uh, we're good. This is supposed to be on every major podcasting app. That That's our hope with this. Obviously, we're learning. So I suppose if you have made it this far, obviously you found out how to get to the podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So hopefully we just keep getting found on this one. Yeah. Uh, and obviously leave us a rating, leave us a review. That's how we get found by more people. Uh, stay with us. We'll, we'll make the best of it. <laughs> it's going to be good, man. It's going to be good. It's going to be fun. Um, yeah. So you're headed to the contest there at, uh, North, is it North Carolina or South Carolina? Yeah, so right now we're about I think two weeks away out. So we got a team two, uh, team practice coming up this weekend again, and then we have a weekend in between there. That's at the teams. The rest of the team's gonna get together. Uh, Gavin here is gonna take my my foot, and for that practice, I'm gonna go elk hunting. Uh, it's the last weekend for elk hunting here, so I'm gonna try to make the best out of that. And then yeah, I go to North Carolina. I'm pretty positive on that. Where's Raleigh? Where's Raleigh? That's North Is Carolina. Raleigh in North yeah, Carolina. North Carolina. Yeah, so we're going to North. I, I'm pretty sure I fly into Raleigh, North Carolina, and then into Greensboro. Yeah. Uh, that's going to be a World Championship Blacksmith Team event that we're going to go into, and so there's a bunch of handy guys going to be hanging out there that we're going to try to get on the podcast. Yeah, so we're hoping to uh, as well get on the line with a couple guys while you're there, and uh, you know we'll kind of do like the remote podcast just like we're doing right now. And then you'll be in person with them, and uh, you know, it'll be pretty sweet, you know, getting to be with those guys in person and not have to do it over the phone, right? Yeah, I think that's probably a big thing that like encouraged me on this, and maybe you, of like you're at a competition, and after the competition's over, and everybody's hanging out at like the bar yeah. and around the anvils and everything, that's the good conversations. Yeah. That's when like education is flowing about life, shoeing horses. Yep. <laughs> the, the goes so much is happening right there yeah. yeah and so it's like hopefully we can catch some of that and bring it to all you guys eventually i want to do like a, going on. like a live live podcast you know i think that'd be so oh, just a live table yeah. you know just be like <laughs> Chaos. come on in you know uh just grab yourself a set of headphones there and get on in on it we're gonna need like 20 more mics <laughs> <at least. laughs> that would be fucking chaos really but yeah. Oh man. It'd be pretty sweet. Um uh, yeah. It's gonna be fun, man. It's gonna be fun. Oh, it's gonna be a blast. Yeah. Well, thanks everyone for listening. Um second one here shoot with the uh Pacific Northwest team should be dropping here pretty soon, so probably in the week after you can look for that one and then we'll get some more recorded. Awesome. Thanks everybody. Thanks.